which they came. Now here we're going to see them begin to differentiate, begin to start to specialize. So some of them are becoming mesoderm and some of them ectoderm. There you see a neuron forming. Here you see a different kind of tissue forming and I'll show you an example of that in a second. One of the big puzzles in biology is to try to control this process now. So these cells with all of this potential that can become any part, how do we tell it what to do? Well, a growth factor which has the funny name Sonic Hedgehog, named after the cartoon character, is actually quite important for telling cells what to do, as is another kind of a growth factor called activin. So these are examples of experiments where we're adding growth factors to cells to tell them what to do. And this is an area where we need lots of help from people like you to begin to figure out what is the combination of signals that will tell these cells what they should become. How do we know that cells can do everything? I told you that the cells can become any part of the body. They're totipotent. Well, in the case of the mouse, there's a very good series of experiments which show that. One is, in culture, they can be seen to differentiate spontaneously, as that little video described. But in addition, we can take stem cells, embryonic stem cells, which are genetically marked, shown here in brown, inject them into a host blastocyst, then reimplant that blastocyst into an, a female mouse. She'll then give birth to a mouse where one can see here that the brown cells have given rise to different parts of the coat color, kind of like a calico cat in this case. What's not shown in this picture is that these cells, if one looked inside the animal, would also give rise to part of the heart, part of the pancreas. In fact, any part of the animal can come from embryonic stem cells. Now these stem cells are greatly important for manipulating genes to study the normal development of animals. And one of the biggest excitements in this field in the last five years has been the derivation or the isolation of embryonic stem cells, not just from mice, but from humans. And I'm going to finish up by showing you that. Human embryonic stem cells come from blastocysts, just like mice. In this case, the blastocysts are previously frozen. They're leftover material from in vitro fertilization clinics. So they're blastocysts which would otherwise be discarded. And with informed consent from the do donors, um, these can be used for research purposes. And as shown here, the inner cell mass is removed. It grows out in a feeder layer. And then there's a colony of human embryonic stem cells shown there on the left. We've been doing this with my colleagues for a few years now. And when we get good, healthy blastocysts from the freezer, with about a 50% efficiency, we can make human embryonic stem cell lines. And so far, in collaboration with Doug Powers at Boston IVF, we've derived about 32 such human embryonic stem cell lines. These stem cells, just like their mouse counterparts, remember, can make any part of the body. And that should really tease you to make you think about what you could do with them. Imagine then a cell that can differentiate into any part of your body. And you can think about injury or other cases of diseases where you might want to repair body parts. I'm going to show you just one of many possible examples of this. This is my favorite example, one that undergraduates at Harvard do, because it shows both the power of these cells and the puzzle. It's an example where human embryonic stem cells are grown in a culture dish and we remove the factors that allow them to self-renew, and they now spontaneously differentiate. Could I have the next video, please? And what you'll see here is that these cells, in some cases, spontaneously make beating muscle, cardiocytes, that is the muscle just like in your heart. Now, of course, here we're seeing four examples of that. You see that they beat at slightly different rates, and obviously, they're not organized into anything like your heart. Your heart which Nadia will be talking about is about the size of your fist. This is a tiny little group of cells, thousands of cells in a Petri dish. But it does raise the interesting question of how did these cells know what to do? How did they make this decision to become cardiomyocytes? What steps were involved? What were the signals that they received perhaps from their neighbors? What I'd like to leave you with then today is this fact that embryonic stem cells can make all cell types. How do they do that? We don't know how they do that, but it's an exciting problem because it'll teach us something about normal development, and it also has the potential to treat diseases where cells are missing, and I'll be talking more about that tomorrow. But for today, let me stop and take questions. Yes? Um, you say 
you're really focused on the external factors that would cause an embryonic stem cell to differentiate. Could you inject a stem cell or implant it into a person and say they have diabetes, then the external factors would take care of itself and it would become a beta mm. cell? That's a great question. So um, let's suppose a person didn't have a beta cell and you wanted to make more. And so you might think, well, let's just take that embryonic stem cell, which we know can make the beta cell, and inject it right into the pancreas. There are two problems, though. It's a good idea. The first is that the pancreas probably is no longer has the signals that instructed the cells of what to become. That was part of the whole history of them getting to that point. The second thing is without the this, this signals which tell every cell you inject to become a beta cell, some of them will kind of willy-nilly go on and do other things, like maybe make those beating heart cells. And in fact, there's a kind of a tumor which mimics this called a teratocarcinoma, which can grow quite large in people, and it has all kinds of differentiated cell types in it, but not in an organized way, in a disorganized way. But your idea is the right one, is how could we take this cell which has the potential to make an, a beta cell and tell it to do that and then put it into a patient? I have time for one more question. What stimulates the like, natural production of growth factors and cytoplasmic factors? That orchestration of how does a cell know which signal it should be sending, which, re which receptors or receivers it should have on, is set up early in development in that period in, during gastrulation when the three germ layers were forming. We don't know exactly how those decisions are made, but we have lots of examples of genes or molecules that can incline cells towards either a different germ layer or a particular cell type. But that's one of the great mysteries of if we have 30,000 genes, how do you mix and match them to get all the different cell types? Thank you all for your attention. Thanks for a terrific lecture, Doug. Where would we be without stem cells? And thank you, students, for your excellent questions. Now a 30-minute break. When we re resume, Nadia Rosenthal will continue our stem cell exploration, focusing on regeneration.